GM, and welcome to my crash course in Cocos Creator. Cocos Creator is a cross-platform game engine used by many developers all over the world. We can create 2D and 3D games for browsers, desktops, mobile, and even consoles. In this course, we'll scratch the surface of Cocos Creator and learn the basics of the engine. Let's begin. Open a new tab and go to Cocos.com and click download now. You'll need to download the Cocos dashboard. This is a convenient tool that helps you manage your Cocos projects. Once it's done, open the dashboard. It may prompt you to create an account. Now let's download Cocos Creator. Go to the editor tab, click download and get the latest version. Once it's finished, go to the project tab and click new to create a new project. Choose the empty 2D template. Then enter a name for your project and choose a location where you want to save it. Finally, click create. Let's start with navigating the editor. In the scene panel, you can easily zoom in and out of your scene using the mouse wheel or scroll gesture. And pan around the scene by simply right click dragging. By default, the content size for the canvas is locked but you can easily change it in the project settings. Go to the top menu and click project, then project settings. In here, you'll find the content size option where you can modify the width and height values to fit the screen resolution you're targeting. Now let's import some assets to the project. To keep things organized, let's create a new folder by right clicking on assets and select folder. Name it sprites. This will hold all of our image assets. Download the sprites from the link in the description. These are free game assets from craftpix.com. Open the folder and go to ORC, PNG, PNG sequence, and then we'll choose the running animation. Select all the images and simply drag and drop them into the folder. Now let's add a sprite to the scene. There are a few ways to add sprites. One way is to right click on the canvas, create, empty node. By creating an empty node, we have a base to which we can attach many components to for creating our sprite. In the inspector panel, we can see the different components attached to the node we created. Each component controls certain properties. This knowledge will be valuable when we delve into scripts later in this course. The node component mainly controls the position, rotation, and scale of our sprite. The UI transform component, on the other hand, controls the content size and anchor point, which is set to the center of the node. Now let's add a sprite component to our node by clicking Add Component, 2D, Sprite. The sprite component allows us to set an image on our node. Let's add the first image we imported to the sprite frame property. Another way is to create 2D object sprite. This will add a node with a sprite component already attached and we'll just need to update the sprite frame. The quickest way is to simply drag and drop an image onto the scene. It will automatically create a node with a sprite component attached and the sprite frame set. You can also select the sprite directly from the sprite frame property by clicking the small arrow and choosing the image. Now let's learn how to modify nodes and their properties. But first, let's change the name of our sprite to orc. Now let's start with the move gizmo. We can control the position of our sprites by grabbing one of the arrows to move it along a specific axis or as a center to move it freely. You can also edit any of the property's values directly in the inspector panel. The rotate gizmo allows us to control the rotation of our sprite. You can change the anchor points to determine where the rotation happens. Basically, the anchor points define the point of origin in a node. The scale gizmo enables us to adjust the scale of our sprite, making it bigger or smaller. And the Rect Gizmo allows us to control the height and width of our sprite. It's very useful when resizing UI elements or other rectangular objects. 
Let's size down New York and position him on the left side of the scene. There are three ways to preview your project. The browser, the editor, and the simulator. We're going to select the editor for now. Let's save our scene. Create another folder in the assets panel called scenes and place our scene file inside. Now click the play button to start the preview. While previewing, you can interact with your scene, test functionality, and get a real-time feel of how your game will behave. Now let's get into scripts. Scripts handles all the logic and interactivity in our game. Let's first configure the default script editor and preferences. Go to Program Manager and paste the path to your editor. This will allow us to easily open and edit our scripts in our preferred code editor. Let's create a folder called Scripts. And in it, let's create a new script file. Create, TypeScript, New Component. Let's name this Orc. This will contain the functionality specific to our Orc sprite. Now double click the file to open the editor. But before we write any code, let's attach the script to the node. By attaching the script component to the Orc, we can define the behavior and add custom logic to it through code. Select the node in the scene or hierarchy panel. Add component and in the search bar type script and it'll display a list of custom scripts we've created. Select the orc script. Let's head back to our code editor. In Coco's creator, the start method is a special function that gets called when the script component is initialized or when the scene starts running. We can use the start method to perform initial setup or execute code that needs to run at the beginning of our scene. In it, we'll add the following line of code. This dot node. In TypeScript, the this keyword refers to the class we're in, which also extends the component class, which holds all the components in their methods, including the node component from your sprite. Next is dot set position to set the position of our sprite node. The first parameter represents the X coordinate, which we'll set to 350. This will set our orc to the right side of the scene. And the second parameter represents the Y coordinate. We don't want to change the Y value, so we'll use a read only method to get the sprite's current Y position. This dot node dot position dot Y. Let's save the file and run the project to see the changes. Now our orc is on the right side of the scene. Now let's get a nodes component with the get component method. First, replace the other line with this get component. This method retrieves any other components attached to the node. In this case, we're going to manipulate the properties specific to the UI transform component. Make sure UI transform is imported at the top. We then call the set content size method to set the size of the components width and height. The first param is for the width, which we'll keep the same. We're going to use get component again, then content size width. Now we'll make the height 90. Save and run the project. Now our arc is squished. Let's refactor the line to improve the readability and maintainability of our code. By storing the UI transform component in a variable, we can reuse it without needing to call get component multiple times. Let's delete the code and focus on the update method. The update method is another special function that gets called every frame during the game loop. It allows us to perform continuous updates and calculations between frames. The delta time parameter represents the amount of time since the last frame update. Now, let's write some code that will move our sprite to the right. Let's take a closer look. We're using the set position method to update the position of our sprite node and the X coordinate of the position is being updated by adding 100 units multiplied by delta time to the current X coordinate value. 
We use get position instead of position to allow us to manipulate the X value. Save and run. And now our orc moves across the scene. Let's continue and learn more about decorators. Decorators allow us to define properties we set in our scripts and modify them directly in Coco's Creator. I also linked a video in the description by the Coco's team themselves explaining all about decorators. Now let's create one to change the speed of the orc. This decorator specifies that the property named speed should be of type number with the default value of zero. Now that we have our speed property defined, let's replace the value 100 with speed in the set position method. By doing this, we're using the value of the speed property instead of a hard coded number. Save the file and head back to Coco's creator. We can now adjust the speed value directly in the script component. Let's set the speed value to 100. Run the project and we can see that the orc is moving to the right like before. You can adjust the speed to make it go faster or slower if you want. Now let's get into input events. We'll start with mouse events. Mouse events allow us to interact with our game with user inputs from the mouse. Let's create a new script file in our scripts folder and name it mouse script. In our mouse script file, let's add the onload method. These are actually called lifecycle callback functions. The cycle goes onload, on enable, start, update, late update, on disable, and on destroy. As long as we define the specific callback function, Coco's creator will automatically execute it in that specific period, and we don't need to call them manually. The onload function gets triggered when the node is activated for the first time, such as when the scene is loaded or when the node is activated. Now, inside onload, we'll write this node on input event type mouse underscore down and our function will be an inline function console logging mouse down this code attaches an event listener to the mouse down event in the node so when we left click the event is triggered logging the message mouse down to the console now that our mouse script is ready let's head to coco's and add the script component to our orc node if you haven't already and to ensure the mouse down event is captured Let's set the speed of the orc to zero. Preview the scene. Go to the console tab to see the output of our mouse event. Now, when we click on the orc sprite, we should see the mouse down message logged in the console. We can access information about the mouse event with an additional parameter called the event that's a type of event mouse. Let's refactor the console log inside the event listener to display a more informative message. For now, we're going to log the name of the node we clicked on with event current target name. Let's save and preview again and test the updated mouse event. Now when we click on the orc, we should see the same message followed by the name of the target logged in the console. When attaching an event listener using this.node, it refers to the specific node that the script component is attached to. On the other hand, using input refers to the global input manager. It allows us to handle input events across the entire scene rather than being restricted to a specific node. As a bonus, we'll be exploring event bubbling. It's an important topic to understand when working with event listeners. Let's start with attaching mouse script to our canvas. Now let's preview and see the effect of event bubbling when we click the orc. As we click the orc, the event triggers on the canvas as well. Let's take a moment to understand what event bubbling means. It basically refers to an event going from a child node to its parent node, level by level until the root node is reached. When event bubbling is enabled, 
which is by default. An event triggered on a child node will also trigger the event listeners on its parent node. However, by setting event.bubbles to false, we disable this behavior and prevent the event from traveling further up the hierarchy. Save and preview again. Notice that with the event bubbling disabled, the console log only displays the log message for the node we clicked on. Now that we understand mouse events, let's get into keyboard events. Same as before, let's create a script and call it keyboard script. Let's open it and start coding. First, we'll define a method called onKeyDown. This will be triggered when a key is pressed down. It takes a parameter called event of type event keyboard. Inside, let's use a switch statement to handle different key codes. We'll start with the Z key by writing keycode.key underscore Z and log pressed Z to the console. In our example, when the Z key is pressed, the case for that key will execute and the message pressed Z will be logged to the console. Now to make our script actually listen for keyboard events, we need to add the following code inside the onload method. This will listen for when you press down on a key, and when you do, it'll execute the onKeyDown method we made earlier. Let's save the script and add it to our org. Switch to preview in browser and run the scene. We can then open the browser console with command option J for Mac or control shift J for Windows. Now every time you press down on the Z key, the message will be logged to the console. Now let's add movement to our orc and make it walk to the right when we press the right arrow key. Back in our keyboard script, let's create a boolean variable called isWalking and set it to false. This will track whether the orc is currently walking or not. Next, let's handle the key up event to stop the orc from walking. Duplicate the line of code that listens for the key down event, but this time, change the event type to key up and the function name to on key up. In the on key down method, Let's change the case in the switch statement to keycode.arrow underscore right. This will be the key that triggers the orc to start walking. Now instead of logging to the console, let's set is walking to true when the right arrow key is pressed down. We also need to handle the key up event to stop the orc from walking. Duplicate the on key down method and change its name to on key up. This will be called when you lift your finger off the right arrow key. Inside the method, let's set is walking to false. Now in the update method, we'll write an if statement to check if is walking is true. If it is, we'll move the orc to the right using the set position method and replace the speed variable with 100. Save the script and run the scene. When you press the right arrow key, the orc should start walking to the right. Release the key, and the orc should stop. Now that we can move the orc with keyboard events, let's animate a walking cycle for it. Let's create a new folder called Animation. Inside, create a new animation clip and name it Walking. Next, let's add the animation component to the orc, and set the default clip to Walking. Click on the Animation tab and enter Animation Editing Mode. This will open up the Animation Editor for us to create animations. Let's start by adding frames to our walking animation. Add a new prop track by clicking the plus button, then CC Sprite, Sprite Frame. This will track all the frames for this property in our animation. Let's click the small diamond button to add a new keyframe. Continue moving the timeline two frames ahead and add 11 more keyframes.
Now let's update each keyframe with the corresponding sprite image. Make sure the blue time control line is on the keyframe you want to update before changing any property values. Drag and drop each sprite to each keyframe. Now press the play animation button to preview the animation. To make the animation loop seamlessly, change the wrap mode to loop. Save your changes in the animation editor by clicking the save button on the top left. Then, close the animation editor to interact with Kogo's creator normally. Now let's make the orcs walking animation play automatically when the scene loads. In the animation component, turn on play on load. Let's save the scene and run it. We should see the orcs walk animation playing on a loop. And we can still move the orc to the right. Now let's make the walk animation play only when the right arrow key is pressed. Turn off play on load. Then back in the keyboard script, inside the is walking if statement, we'll get the animation component and smoothly transition to the walking animation with crossfade. Additionally, if is walking is false, we'll stop the animation using stop. Save and run the scene. Now when we press the right arrow key, the orc will start walking with the walking animation. And when we release the key, the animation will stop. Now let's dive deeper into animations with event frames. Event frames allow us to trigger functions at a specified frame of an animation. But first, let's set up the animations we're going to use. Let's create two more animation clips named Idle and Attack. And then add them to the orcs animation component by increasing the clips count. Then either select the animation or drag and drop them in. Set the default clip to idle to make the orc start in the idle state. Enter the animation editing mode and let's see what we need to set up the animations. In the idle clip, there's one keyframe on the first frame with the orc's idle sprite image attached. Now in the attack animation, import the sprites from the slashing folder and set them on the keyframes in order. This will be a total of 12 keyframes that are 2 frames apart. While setting up the frames, you may notice that the content size of the orc is not displayed right. To fix that issue, go to the orc sprite component and set the size mode to raw and unchecked trim to preserve the original content size of the sprite. Let's size down our orc again and position it back where it was. Preview the animation again to see that the content size now remains the same. Now let's make the orc jump a bit while attacking. Add a position prop track to the attack animation. Then set a keyframe on the Y position at frame 0. Add another keyframe at frame 4 and adjust the Y position to lift up the orc a bit. Finally, add the last keyframe at frame 8 and set the Y position to the same value as the first frame. Now we see the orc jump up right before striking down. Now let's add an event frame at frame 8 by clicking the diamond icon with the plus symbol here. Double click the orange diamond and create a function called onHit, then click the plus button. Save and close the animation editor. Then let's update the keyboard script to incorporate the new animations and frame events. This stop animation line is actually an issue because the update method will keep executing it, which will cancel out any other animation we try to play. So let's move it to the onKeyUpK statement and delete the else statement. 
Next, add a new case in the on key down switch statement that triggers when the spacebar is pressed. This is where we'll play the attack animation. Now let's implement the on hit event frame method that we created in the animation editor. In this method, we'll log hit to the console for now. As long as the method names match, it'll execute the code we write at the frame we put the event. So it's best to keep event names unique. Save the script and run the scene. Open the console and press the spacebar. You can see when the orc smashes down his weapon, the frame event triggers. Now let's add some audio to our orc and the scene. Download the two audio clips linked in the description. These clips will be used for background music and a sound effect. Create a new folder called audio and place the two clips inside it. Remove the script component from the canvas node and add an audio source component instead. This component will handle playing audio in the scene. Set the clip property in the audio component to background.mp3. Also enable loops so the music plays continuously. Run the scene and you should hear the background music playing. Now let's add the hit sound effect to the attack animation of our orc. First, remove the mouse script component on the orc. Then, in the orc script, remove the set position line. Change the decorator type to audio clip and the decorator name to hit. And set the value to null. Back in Cocos, set the hit property of the orc script to the hit mp3. Back in the script, We'll add a new audio source and code to control any of the audio the orc makes. Let's take the onHit method from the keyboard script and place it in the orc script. And replace the console log with this line. Play one shot will play the audio once, which is great for sound effects. Save and run the scene. Now when you attack with the orc, you should hear the sound effect as the weapon hits the ground. Now for the last topic of this crash course, let's learn how to transition between scenes and set our starting scene when we're ready to build our game. Let's create a new scene in the scenes folder and name it main. Double click on the file to enter the scene editor. Let's add a label to our canvas to serve as our play button. Create 2D object label. Rename the label to play and change its font size and line height to 100 to make it more visible. Change the string property to play. To use a custom font, uncheck use system font and set the font property to your desired font. Note that with some fonts, the text may be cut off, so it's a good idea to add a space at the start and the end of the text. To make the label clickable, we'll need to add a button component to it. Let's create a new script in the scripts folder and call it main script. And add it to the canvas. This script will control everything in the scene. Open main script and add a decorator. Set the type to button and name it play and set the value to null. Back in Cocos, assign the play button to the play property. The decorator is looking for a node with a button component attached and our play label has one. Inside the main script, add the onload method. In this method, we'll create an event listener on the play button for when the button is clicked. And inside the callback function, we'll load the scene with our orc. 
The director object in Coco's creator is responsible for managing scene loading and transitions. Here, we're using it to load our scene named Scene when the play button is clicked. You can rename it to Gameplay so it's not confusing. Just remember to change the name where we load the scene and main script. Let's run the main scene and test our play button. You should see the main scene transition to the gameplay scene. And everything works just the same. When we're ready to publish our game, we can configure the build settings. Click on build in the top right and you'll see various options for our project. We can select a specific scene to start with and start scene. We'll choose main to ensure that when the players launch our game, they'll start with the scene with the play button. And that's a wrap for our crash course in Coco's Creator. We've covered a wide range of topics to gain a solid foundation in using Coco's Creator. Links to the documentation for each topic is in the description. Like and share if you found this video helpful either to you or someone you may know. Be sure to subscribe for more tutorials in the future. Thanks for watching and see you in the next one.